You've now been joined with Arrow iHeartRadio. Hello and good morning, Ebony. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. Uh, you know the way she said iHeartRadio. It's very interesting that I was at iHeartRadio uh, during those days when the reason why they called an app radio is because people understand radio. And so all these years mm-hmm. later, there here's this book called Love Radio. I mean, it's it's, it's that <laughs> one thing that seems to have disappeared off the map, but yet no, it's not out of our vocabulary yet. <laughs> No, it's absolutely not out of our vocabulary. And I did a lot of research to confirm that teenagers still listen to the radio, and they do. So, of course, I had to write a book about it. Well, one one of the things, I'm blessed with the opportunity to talk to modern-day musicians, and and Michael Buble being one of them just the other day, and and they are so attracted to radio. What, What is your attraction to it? So, my attraction to radio is I grew up in the Detroit metro area, and my mother and I, when we were driving to and from work and school, that's what we listened to. It was like clockwork. Every morning we would listen to all the morning shows mm-hmm. like Donnie Simpson and Ricky Smiley and all these morning shows that we loved growing up. And we would hear, you know, the celebrity gossip and the, the <laughs> pranks, the hilarious pranks um, and the love advice. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. But when I was coming up with this character, Prince Jones, I knew that he wanted to be a love expert. And so I was trying to figure out how would he, you know, dish this advice. And the obvious, easier answer was social media, but I felt like I wanted to stretch myself as a writer, and I kept coming back to these morning shows. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if a high school teenager, you know, teens are that that breed, that that rare group that people don't take as seriously, and we should because they're going to change the world. And so what if we see a bit, a glimpse of that in Prince and how he gives advice, but it's amazing advice and he reads up on it and he does his research and he's really passionate about it. So that's how, um, Love Radio came to be. Yeah, and the book we're talking about is Love Radio. I was that teen jock. I got in the business at the age of 14. I did get those listeners that just wanted to be listened to. And and do you know that I still have friendships with listeners that are now 43 years in distance? I mean, it's it's amazing oh when, when radio that people listen to real people. I mean, it, it, you were there for us yeah. just as much as we were there for you. Oh, my God, that's so amazing. Yeah, there's actually a scene in the book where he talks about it's I was just basically talking about how the radio, it can be a form of therapy. You're talking to somebody that you feel like, you know, but also there's a little bit of a distance so that you can be yourself. And so I think it's so beautiful that you have these relationships all these years later. Also, that you were a teenage DJ. That's amazing. Well, and I think that's why a lot of of adults are going to pick up this book as well, because you're going to be tapping into something that was so personable to them. And I mean, whether it was Mm -hmm. on their way to school or work or whatever, radio has always been there. And I think that people want to know what what really happens between the jock as well as the listener and there there, <laughs> there really are stories it's more than just the music yeah most definitely you know humanizing everybody right um and i i for me personally like i i love the radio like i was always obsessed with the radio and i just remember you know whether i was sick and, and my, i would have my mom you know play jazz so that it soothed me as a like, like as a kid too so it's quite hilarious um but there was something just so magical about the radio and music and how you were able to like you know a mode of, of a mood with the music that you play or or the timing or you know all of those things um really shaped me and it's the reason why i wrote this book what's so interesting about this is that a lot of listeners don't realize this but detroit is one of the greatest places for radio i mean some of the biggest names in radio mm-hmm. history have all come from that including casey Kasem from american top 40 was in D- detroit radio and and and, and so i mean it's it, you're going to be rocking up their own personal lives in their own city by sharing this story yeah most definitely i i just think of detroit in general as uh a, a time capsule of America mm-hmm. and, and how it's birthed the musical sound and radio was such an important part to it because, you know, there was Motown and there are ways in which they had to make sure these records were distributed. And so, so many of these, you know, I would say local celebrities popped up who were really the ones doing the work, who were doing the, the marketing the street team, you know, the promotional work and making sure that these new artists were heard and, they were just as important to, you know, making sure Motown became what it was as, you know, the artists were to it. It was, it was really, a, it was really beautiful how a lot of DJs were able to put 
so many amazing artists from Motown on the map by doing this, the work that they did. I'll tell you what, what's really interesting about that story is they, they called them the Pied Pipers of rock and roll. A lot of radio stations in the South, because mm-hmm. that's where I am right now, is in the South. They would wait till their program directors went to bed and then they would bring out the oh, Motown wow. and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and here's another thing uh, that, you know, that we have beach music here in, in the Carolinas and beach music in reality was what they played at the beach. And when you went there, you didn't listen to Pat Boone. You listened to... R and B mm-hmm. and Motown, so they named it beach music. Mm-hmm. That's how important radio played in all of this. Yeah, most definitely. Like you're able to cross all those cultural lines and make sure this music is put out there, and and music that should rightfully so be put out there. Like, why was there this hesitation because of the color of someone's skin? You yeah. know, like this was music that it is still to this day. Like the way that these artists are sampled constantly is, uh, is really magnificent, magnificent. Sorry. So it's, it's, it's beautiful to see, you know, what radio has done for all of these artists and, and what it's done for music in general. So what was it about Danny that Prince Jones, you know, all of a sudden he befriended her and thought, you know what, I mean, she's she's got a, you know, a little bit of a distance when it comes to some love here, but I think that she can learn how to mm-hmm. love. So I think Danny is someone that he's just, just fell for from the moment that he met her in middle school. And I, I do believe that, you know, there can be love at first sight, and I think Prince had it. I, for me personally, when I was writing the story, when I was crafting the story, I knew the character uh, I wanted Danny to be. I came up with her first because mm-hmm. for me growing up and watching a lot of romances, specifically romances targeted to teenagers, you know, there was Twilight, there was 10 Things I Hate About You, there was The Notebook, there were all these romance movies that ne- didn't necessarily center black teenagers, um, black teenage girls as the lead. We were always a side character. And, you know, I want to be the lead. I want to be wooed. I want to feel, you know, this magical <laughs> romance. And so that was how Danny was formed. I didn't want her to be, you know, the most likable character. I wanted her to, you know, come off a little cold because I wanted a teenage girl to know, black teenage girl to know that you also deserve to be courted and loved in the way that, you know, all these movies that you watch showcase and Prince was formed because I wanted Prince to rule Danny. You know, I wanted her to be swept off her feet. So that is why Prince was always in love with her, always first love at first sight because Danielle Ford was the catch in my opinion. And I wanted to show, um, him sleeping her off our feet. That's every bit the reason why my why my wife, who's a school teacher, loves this book. Because you're right. You the you, you know when it comes to black love, they should be able to the students and those that are growing beyond teenhood and stuff like that need to be able to look into a book and see themselves and not what they want to be, but rather who they can be. Most definitely, I I realized with a lot of these movies that I would watch growing up. Um, it, there's I, I, like I would look at them and be like, oh, there's no way that like a guy could approach me like that, or there's no way we would go to an event like that, or there's no way we would do these things. So it was really fun coming up with the dates because a lot of the dates are like references, Detroit references. And so I wanted to show a teenager that like, oh, this is, you know, going to a skating rink, which is something that you do. I wanted to show that this is something that could happen to you. I wanted them to feel like I could fall in love like this if I wanted to. And for like a teenage boy or or a teenage non-binary person who was trying to pursue someone else I wanted them to feel like oh like this is what I have to do you know I I wanted it to also feel like the whole book to feel like one big love advice that they can learn how to you know court someone because I feel like courting is something that is not what it used to be and I was courted you know and it's it's a beautiful thing to be wooed so that's what I wanted to kind of teenagers as well let me ask you a question here only because i have lived the life of being that radio jock did ebony get (laughs) jealous of danny for getting so close to prince jones Ah, (laughs) ah, ah, ah. (laughs) you know no i i was rooting for danny the whole time um i i love writing Danny because like I said Danny's a lot like me Mm -hmm. and I loved what I learned about myself through writing her um I was also very hesitant about love I was I would like to call myself fake cynical because I used to watch a lot of like the black romance movies of the 90s and 2000s with my mother which were you know marketed more towards adults but also there were a lot of coming of age stories that I felt like I connected to I, so I knew I wanted that love. I just didn't know, like, if I would ever get it or if someone was mature enough for someone like me. You know, all of the things that 
a teenage girl would feel. So it was fun writing her and like finding a natural way to make sure that she, I wanted the story to feel natural. So as Danny was opening up, you as the reader can feel like, oh, she, she really is starting to like him and like very, you know, small details that I like sprinkled throughout the book. So it was fun for me because I was trying to figure out when I was writing, at what point is she going to be like, okay, he's it. I'm, I'm going all the way in. And it was fun. So it, it like came to me, like I felt like a reader. It was coming to me as I was writing the story. So I, there was no jealousy because it was fun writing that. So writing the book is one thing. Now you're inside the business world of writing. So who comes after you to put this mm-hmm. into motion pictures? Is it going to be Tyler Perry? Is it going to be Oprah on own? Or is BET going to capture this and make it into a series? Come on now. I, I, no comment. I have no idea who, <laughs> what, where, how, why. Because <laughs> you know but that it would be a lot of fun. this is the one thing that's missing from the entertainment world. You've got you have got the passion and the energy to share the story to 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 young people, but but that's that seems to be the one thing that's missing from these networks. Listen, if if anyone calls me up, let me know. I, I'd love to. <laughs> it would be great to make Love Radio a movie or a series, but. You know, I'm happy that it's in a book form now, and I hope people can read it and feel, I hope it feels like a movie as uh, readers are reading it. You publish by day and you share stories at night. That's a, Where's the separation between church and state in that? Because, I mean, I, I, I keep a defrag journal because of the multiple lives that I live in, in a creative world. <laughs> what, what do you do to, to make sure that everybody gets, you know, a fair enough attention? So, um, well, right now I'm, I'm actually on a break, and this is very, very new because I did want to focus on publishing my first novel and making sure that I have the energy to publish it. And I think that is important to say because we are taught in this society that, you know, you should be doing everything all the time. And, and COVID really had us all kind of take a beat and say, like, you know, rest is important as well. And so that is my way of taking the beat. But when I was doing both, I was able to manage both just fine because there's the business side of publishing and then there's the emotional side of being an artist. Mm -hmm. And so once I, you know, once my book was acquired and I met my marketing and publicity team, I gave my ideas at the beginning of like some things that I think would be cool to do. But I told myself that I had to trust my team and I am dealing with a lot of emotions and like newly formed anxiety that I had never experienced before to like put your art into the world. And so it was actually pretty easy for me to separate because working gave me, you know, kind of like a, I was able to like shift my energy from myself into other people. And that was actually really fulfilling for me because I, I get, I get bored with myself. I'm a Gemini. So I need multiple things going on. Oh, you're a Gemini. I'm a cancer. Oh my God. No no wonder we're getting together here. (laughs) So we're, we're in your season right now. Are we not? Yes, we are. So my book is off book, Jim and I. <laughs> See, now, now one of the things that, that that's great about what, what you're doing with this novel is the fact that you're no longer what I call a writer hider, somebody who takes w- what they've written and hides it underneath <laughs> the bed. That. And so, but there are people that are listening to us right now that are writer hiders. How can we get them to release their stories? So I will say as someone who worked in publishing, it was, it was scary at first, but also it was really helpful um, to see a manuscript when it first comes in, like when it's really raw and seeing what an editor can do to tighten it up. I think there is a fear, especially when you're reading other writers and you're like, oh, this book is so good. I love this book so much. I wish I could write like that. You know, writing takes time and practice. If you want to be better at it, you have to keep going at it every single day. And so my challenge to myself when I was afraid to write, but I knew I had to with Ebony. It's okay. Nobody has to see this. If you write something and it sucks, it can go in your trash and no one has to know. But you have to write the thing. And when you go to, when you come to your computer, when you come to your journal, when you come to the page, just write. Stop trying to edit while you write. Stop trying to, you know, make it sound better. You have to get it off the page. You know, you have to get it onto the page first. And then revisions can come in and you can tighten it up and make it better. Um, but you have to write the thing and you have to be consistent with it because when you, I think when you step away for too long from a piece of work that you're working on, you can, you can lose yourself. Like you can lose the characters. You can use the vibes if you're in it every single day or as much as you can. Um, it, it, it comes up fresh. And even when you're not writing, you're thinking about it. And so before work, I would actually get up earlier and I would write first before the day started and work consumed me. And I would get a couple, I would get an hour or two in and I would start like 
At first, I started every Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then I switched it to Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And before you know it, you're looking forward to getting up to write your thing because you've been so consistent and it's just flowing. So I would just tell anybody out there who is afraid to do it, to just do it, and you'll be shocked at, like, what comes out of it. And then you'll be shocked at when your book is getting published, what an editor will do to make it even better. <laughs> <laughs> That's every reason why I host a show on iHeartRadio called Stream Thinking. It is, it is about being in the power of now. And, and when you allow mm -hmm. the, those words to flow through you without judgment, it's amazing what comes through a writer's mind. Exactly, exactly. Wow. I, there were so many hurdles that I had to get over. And once I pushed those to the side, like the way things flowed, it, it, was, it was eerie yeah. how easy it was that everything came out that was in my head. So I completely agree with you. Absolutely. Ebony, where can people go to find out more about you? I mean, I realize this is your first novel, but I guarantee we'll be talking 20 mm -hmm. times more. I, I just know it. Oh, you're so sweet. So you can find me um, on Instagram, all the social media platforms at Ebony Liddell. You can learn more about me in the book at ebonyliddell.com. And the book is available wherever books are sold. Oh, be brilliant today, please. <laughs> I'm so, I'm just, thank you so much. I'm so excited and honored. And this has just been a dream. And I, I just, uh, it's so overwhelming, but it's in the best possible way to be able to be talking to a, a radio station about my book about radio. <laughs> That's what makes it so beautiful. <laughs> Have a great day today, okay? Thank you so much. You bet. Bye-bye.